so there's this guy named Stephen Meyer. He runs a Discovery Institute, and he's like a, a Christian nationalist nutcase kind of guy. He went on PragerU to talk about how evolutionism doesn't make any sense and how creationism is the correct way to, blah, 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 you know, the type. Anyway, let's listen and see what he has to say in this PragerU video, and we'll debunk as we go. In a recent interview, while I was presenting some scientific discoveries that may point to the existence of God, a camera operator, a young woman whom I'll call Maria, began to weep visibly. Later, she told me the reason for her tears. Like many young people, Maria believed in God when she arrived in college. But while there, she repeatedly encountered professors who insisted that based on the science, God was a myth. No more real than Santa Claus. Wait, I'm sorry, one more time? But while there, she repeatedly encountered professors who insisted that based on the science, God was a myth. You, so, you, all right, I'm sorry. Let me just try to clarify this. You're saying at a science conference, this girl was super upset because scientists kept saying that God is a myth. Why would scientists be standing up there talking about God at all? I'm sorry, it has nothing to do with God, like biology, science, and all that stuff. I, I'm having a hard time believing you here. No more real than Santa Claus. Maria didn't feel equipped to challenge her professors. She eventually left college with nagging doubts about her faith. And oh, okay, it wasn't at a science conference. It was at college, specifically. All right. Under Again, I, I seriously doubt it. Professors, she eventually left college with nagging doubts about her faith and wondered whether life, including her own life, might be nothing more than a cosmic accident. Men I, I mean, maybe. Yeah, right? It's possible. I can see that. Who knows? Many young people share Maria's doubts. Indeed, powerful voices in the academy tell us that science makes belief in God and human significance untenable. Like creationists are desperate to portray themselves as victims and make it seem like scientists are trying to destroy belief in God. That's just not the case. They have simply positioned themselves in opposition to science. That's all. If you didn't want to feel persecuted by science, then accept the fact that evolution is real. Accept the facts of the world around you and stop pushing against science at every turn. Scientific knowledge that we absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, know for a fact. We know for a fact that evolution takes place. That is just what it is. Stop pushing against it if you don't want to feel persecuted. There, it's a problem that they're creating in their own minds. Or as Richard Dawkins, the famed atheist from Oxford, has asserted, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Yeah, but is Richard Dawkins famous for being a professor? Or is he famous for being an atheist and an intellectual? He's framing this up as though Richard Dawkins is just another professor at another college trying to destroy belief in God. It's nonsense. But are we the product of such indifference, that is, purely materialistic processes that did not have us in mind, as another scientific atheist has put it? Does the universe have the properties we should expect if this all-there-is-is-matter vision of reality is correct? Okay, I don't think that any professors are claiming outright all-there-is-is-matter. I think there are a lot of professors out there who are more than willing to accept supernatural stuff. In fact, many do accept supernatural stuff. There are a ton of Christian professors, countless. But we don't need something more to understand the world around us. That's the point. Perhaps not. Three major scientific discoveries contradict the expectations of scientific atheists. Okay. And point instead in a distinctly God-friendly direction. First, the Big Bang. Discoveries in observational astronomy and developments in theoretical physics have revealed that the universe had a beginning. Oh boy, here we go. Notice the use of the word observational astronomy there. That's an answers in Genesis thing, where they try to draw a line between observational science and historical science. And they claim uh, people can do observational science, or creationists can do observational science just like anybody else. but evolutionists are doing historical science. It's absurd. It's such a fucking joke. Anyway, um, what they said here, theoretical physics have revealed that the universe had a beginning. Yeah, the Big Bang. Yes. Okay. I don't understand what point he's getting to here. 
This is contrary to the expectation of scientific materialists who long portrayed the universe as eternal and self-existent. And there I mean, 200 years ago. Therefore, in no need of an external creator. This There's no need for an external creator anyway in any of this process at all. You know, Stephen Meyer is famously associated with the Discovery Institute, which is like a right-wing, like, cr Christian nationalist, evangelical think tank or whatever, just a nutcase institution. But aside from that, he is anti-evolution. And it seems like the position that he's advocating for here is not anti-evolution, but he's advocating for a system in which God was like the first cause, like 14 billion years ago. This evidence for a beginning has instead confirmed the expectation of theists. Nobel laureate Arno Penzias helped make a key discovery establishing a cosmic beginning. He later observed, the best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the first five books of Moses and the Bible as a whole. Okay, fine, great. You want to believe in God and also accept the, the facts of science? That's fine. But that's not why we're here. Stephen Meyer rejects evolution, which is like a fundamental component of every um, branch of science that we have today. You cannot reject evolution and call yourself a science, a scientific-minded person, or anything other than a science denier. And aside from that, Moses did not write those books, okay? It details Moses' death in those books. He didn't write them. Moses wasn't even real. And he's not alone. Cosmological <laughs> evidence has led other prominent scientists, including former MIT physicist Gerald Schroeder and the great Caltech astronomer Alan Sandage, to affirm a transcendent creator beyond space and time as the best explanation for the origin of our finite universe. Oh, so you're telling me that science affirms God and that scientists affirm that God is real now. So you aren't persecuted then, is what you're saying. Just a reminder, I would really appreciate it if you guys checked out my Patreon. If you're not going to donate, you don't have to, but follow me there at the very least, owenmorgan.com slash Patreon, just in case something happens with the government or whatever. It would be really good if you had some way to connect with me and my content. I'm really concerned about that. And maybe you should consider that for other creators too. Second, fine tuning. We live in what Australian physicist Luke Barnes calls an extremely fortunate universe, where fundamental laws and physical parameters have somehow been fine tuned with just the right strengths and values to make life possible. Interesting, interesting claim. I see your claim and raise you. The Puddle Analogy by Douglas Adams, I believe, guy that wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. It goes like this. Imagine a puddle waking up one morning and thinking, this is an interesting world I find myself in, an interesting hole I find myself in. Fits me rather neatly, doesn't it? In fact, it fits me staggeringly well. Must have been made to have me in it. We find ourselves in an environment that's perfect for maintaining life because life exists here. We couldn't live in a world where life couldn't exist because life couldn't exist there. It makes sense that we find ourselves here. What would be proof of God is if we lived in bodies that required oxygen, but our atmosphere was not made up of oxygen. In fact, there was no oxygen in the, in the atmosphere, yet we continued to survive despite the fact that there's no oxygen here. That would be living in an environment in which we couldn't live, and it would truly be evidence of something very, very strange. That is not what we see. We live in an environment perfectly suited to us, and that is evidence that we live in an environment perfectly suited to us. That's it. That's the answer to the fine-tuning argument. The incredible odds against this happening by chance has led even agnostic and atheistic physicists to marvel. Uh, no. As British physicist Paul Davies has exclaimed, the impression of design is overwhelming. No. Atheist physicist George Greenstein expresses similar cognitive dissonance. The thought insistently arises that some supernatural agency must be involved. Okay, how much you want to bet that this is taken completely out of context. Now, who did he say? George Greenstein? Yep, this is a, a quote mine, as far as I can tell. Of course. Who's surprised by that? 
The quote comes from page 27 of Greenstein's book, The Symbiotic Universe, 1988, but Meyer conveniently cuts it off. Greenstein continues by asking, is it possible that suddenly without heeding, I'm sorry, that suddenly without intending to, we've stumbled upon scientific proof of the existence of a supreme being? Was it God who stepped in and so providentially crafted the cosmos for our benefit? The critical part Meyer omits. Later in the same book, page 87, Greenstein explicitly states, quote, it is a matter of taste how one deals with that notion. Those who wish are free to accept it, and I have no way to prove them wrong, but I know where I stand. I reject it utterly. So it was a rhetorical question that he rejected immediately after, basically, is the point. Third, the complexity of life. Molecular biology has revealed the presence in living cells of an exquisite world of informational nanotechnology. Digital code in DNA and RNA. DNA and RNA are not codes. I know that's how it's portrayed or how it's presented for the sake of analogy to try to help people understand or whatever, but that is not what DNA is. I just want to make that clear because people take the analogy too far into a runaway analogy, which completely breaks down. Digital code in DNA and RNA tiny, intricately constructed molecular machines, a complex information storage, transmission, and processing system that resembles but vastly exceeds our most advanced digital high technology, not what anyone would expect to see as the result of blind, materialistic processes. Dawkins himself may have conceded as much when he recently confessed to being knocked sideways with wonder at the miniaturized intricacy of the data processing machinery in the living cell. So, so what should- I'm sorry, so you think that Richard Dawkins admits that he thinks that there is a God? Is, is what you're trying to tell me? Are you serious with this? By the way, guys, check out my new shop, owenmorgan.com slash shop. I have a bunch of really cool designs on there. We make of all this. For their part, scientific atheists have constructed ever more convoluted and fanciful theories. They posit alien designers to- No, look, we don't have to have any hypotheses about this. You have an absurd hypothesis that you must prove. So instead of just trying to prove your hypothesis, you shoot down everyone else's understanding of the world around them. And what scientists are proposing alien designers? There's no, science as a, as a monolith is not proposing that we came here from aliens or that aliens created us or whatever other, uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, or whatever other nonsense. Count for the code of life multiple parallel universes to try to explain fine-tuning. No, no one is trying to explain fine-tuning through a multiverse. And they've developed elaborate mathematical equations in an attempt to use physics to show how the universe could have begun from nothing physical. I mean, do you want us to just stop studying, stop learning, stop exploring entirely? Do you think we should just get the answer God did it and then move on with our lives and never try to learn anything else ever again? Is that what you want? What's the goal here? What are you trying to accomplish with this? But what if the scientific atheists are just wrong? What if the universe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is an intelligent and purposeful creator behind it all? The current state of our universe does not prove or even imply that there is a creator. Everything around us could exist without a creator's involvement. So whether you like this or not, you cannot use it as the basis for your belief. Find something more logical and reasonable, if you want. In my book, Return of the God Hypothesis, I argue that the universe has precisely such properties. And that raises a hopeful possibility that we are not the product of blind, pitiless indifference but instead that we were made on purpose, that we were intended. British historian Paul Johnson has argued that the existence or non-existence of God is the most important question we humans can ever ask. Given the scientific evidence we now have, it might be time to consider or reconsider this question. I'm Stephen Meyer, philosopher of science at the Discovery Institute. Philosopher of science. He's a philosopher of science, he says. Where'd you get that, that title? Is that a degree? Or is it just like a title that you've given yourself? This dude is a joke, seriously. And some of the things that he said, especially like he was on Joe Rogan not too long ago, are disgusting. Tell me what you think in the comments.